All right, we are back here. We are into the new year. We're talking college basketball. We're doing this monthly here with our next guest, the host of the Seeing Red podcast. Troy Merrill is here. Troy, happy new year. How are you? Happy new year, Mike. Happy to be on again and do our kind of monthly chat now, it seems like, with uh, college basketball. Happy to be here. Yeah, the, the, the fans seem to want it, so I, I will get the people what they want. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, it means me coming on more. I'm totally for it. Yeah. It was so funny because the last time we talked was early December and everything was looking good. Then all of a sudden <laughs> COVID came back and COVID has basically been wrecking havoc on college basketball for the last month and a month or so. It's been so frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, 2021 kind of went out how it started, uh, I guess, and how 2020 uh, treated us a lot, you know, a lot of games being canceled. Like I, I just said to you off air, it feels like they're, really hasn't been a consistent like flow to this season now for almost a month, really, since since you and I last uh, spoke. And yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, they're they're obviously revising some policies now. They revised the forfeiture policy, which I think was a big step forward. Hopefully, you know, the worst of it is getting to be behind us if it's not already behind us. And we can kind of get back to the season that we saw in November and early December, where, you know, every scheduled game was actually being played and we weren't worrying about a game being canceled, you know, two hours before it tips off. So hopefully, you know, the next time that we talk, uh, we'll be talking about more games and, you know, we actually have a normal season again. Yeah. I mean, we talked the last time about how, oh, the Saturday before Christmas, you got to take off to watch all these games. And then like <laughs> half the games you missed, it got canceled. I remember the worst was crazy, I think, was Tennessee and Memphis got canceled about 30 minutes before the tip because Memphis had COVID issues and Tennessee had to have a scrimmage for all the fans who actually made it in before they called it, which was insane. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, and it feels like we've seen that a lot with, you know, my team, St. John's two weeks ago had a game canceled, I think five or six hours before it was supposed to tip off. I mean, not as crazy as the example that you just had, but yeah, it just seems like, you know, the day of, you can't really be too certain if your team's going to actually play a game or not because these positives are, are just popping up everywhere. And a lot, in a lot of cases, it's with people that don't even really have symptoms. So they don't know that they have it until they're being tested, which I think is leading to a lot of these late cancellations that we're seeing. Yeah, for sure. I mean, think about some of these teams haven't played. I mean, UCLA has played one game since December 2nd, one, they went to market the 11th. They're coming back on the schedule this week. We had, so like every week there's a different team going on pause or teams on pause. I mean, just around here, the Metro Atlantic athletic conference, I think as of recording, I don't know if it's still accurate, seven of the 11 teams in the league are on COVID pause, which is absurd. And, and you got to remember, too, about that. A lot of these conference schedules are not built like they were last year, where last year, you know, a lot of conferences kind of built it in, assuming that games were going to get canceled or postponed, or postponed really. Um, a lot of the schedules are not built this year for that. So you're going to see teams playing like three games in a, in a, you know, seven day stretch and in a, in a calendar week, uh, just because, you know, we got to make these games up or as best as we can got to make these games up to get teams uh, their, their, you know, scheduled games. Um, you know, it's not like last year where they kind of built in assuming that we were going to have games postponed. I think that a month ago, even we didn't think that we were going to have to deal with that this year. And now, here it is again, unfortunately. So I'm curious to see how that maybe impacts teams, especially in these power conferences like the Big Ten uh, that we're going to get to and the Big 12, where it's just every game is a battle. You know, I'm curious to see when teams have to play three games in a week or, you know, four games in 10 days or whatever, uh, how that's going to impact some of these bigger conference teams. All I have to say is the selection committee has a mess on their hand around trying to sort these things out, whether it's like, oh, do we give this team credit for – have, for losing a, a third game in five, day, in five days, it's because they're tired. Uh, do we mm -hmm. do we take mm -hmm. away from somebody who didn't who beats a team that was missing three key rotation players because of COVID? Yeah. Do we have mm -hmm. a situation where we, uh, like poor Iona, for example, had a big game against Seton Hall get canceled? Do we dock them for that because they wanted to play the game they couldn't play it? Like all oh, that's a big mess. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, even like you mentioned, staying locally, my team, St. John's. They lost a, a horrible game to Pittsburgh, who's maybe the worst power five uh, team in the country, but they didn't have their best player, Julian Champagny, you know, who's, who's, you know, one of the top maybe 20 players in the country. Uh, you know, how do you evaluate a game like that when a team is missing their best player? Uh, Seton Hall, their last two games, uh, they, they lost to Providence and they lost to Villanova, two really good teams, um, but they didn't have two of their big men. They were, they were only playing, I believe, with eight men in uh, both of those games due to COVID protocols and, and guys having, uh, having COVID. So yeah, it's just, it's really interesting to see how they're going to evaluate each individual team. Uh, I, I would assume it's going to be kind of on a case by case thing, but 
you know, like you said, it, it is just going to be a mess in about two months from now when they try to figure this all out. Yeah, two things that have to happen here is number one, the NCAA has to change its number of games down from 25 because last year I think it was 13 to get into the tournament. You have teams like UCLA where they've already had to miss four games of their own. And like, you're asking a lot here with who knows how long this Omicron wave is going to pee. I think you have to drop them like 20 games to like make the tournament. And it might even be lower depending on how, how crazy these outbreaks are. Yeah, I think that's fair. That's, that's a good point as well. I mean, we've seen the NCAA has been um, fluid. Maybe it's taken a little bit more time. Um, but, you know, we've seen these conferences, you know, re- reverse their uh, forfeiture policy and, you know, be postponing games. Or most conferences have done that at least. So, you know, we, we've shown the ability to adapt throughout this season. Uh, they're going to have to keep doing that. And like you mentioned, that's that's a, a great point. You know, we're, we're, you, a lot of teams aren't, aren't going to get or might have trouble getting to the 25 game mark uh, this season just with how it's going right now and how it's probably going to go over the next maybe three, four weeks uh, until hopefully we get, uh, you know, past the, the brunt of, of, uh, of this kind of outbreak here. So hopefully, you know, they do they do show some versatility and adapt to that as well. The other thing that's disappointed me too at the NCAA is the fact that there has been absolutely like no leadership from the top here saying like, you know, like here's some data we have, here's some ideas on how you can manage games. The NCAA has been quiet. It's like conferences, you figure it out on your own. You can take care of this. Like we're going to sit here and make the money. That, that bothers me. Yeah. And, and it feels like it's been that way, right. For the last two years, it's kind of been the NCAA saying, you know, big 10, ACC, SEC, PAC 12, you guys, you know, do your own thing, figure it out. And we'll just kind of be here. I mean, I haven't heard like, or very rarely have I heard someone from the NCAA, you know, putting out a plan and, and like the other leagues kind of have done. Uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. It's been almost two years of this now uh, during this pandemic where the NCAA really hasn't shown that, that leadership that you would hope in terms of, of having an actual plan as to how we're going to deal with this. Yeah, hopefully next time we talk, Kobe will be in a much better spot. We'll have much fewer post moments. But I want to get into one of the things that's been driving my, me crazy a couple of days. I want to ask you this question. Why does ESPN hate college basketball? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll let you tell me because you seem very impassionate about this. So, so you, can, you can tell me first, and then I'll weigh in. Yeah, so anyway, so I, I on the side, I write for fan side. I do college basketball college, and I write the games of the week. And pr- prior to, I think, the week, of, week after Christmas, I look at the schedule, I'm like, oh, Baylor's playing Iowa State. This is two undefeated teams in the Pac-12, I mean the Big 12, two teams in the top 10, and they are playing on New Year's Day. This is a fantastic showcase. Where is this game? It's on ESPNU at noon, and no one can find it because ESPN, if it was, says, we're going to put the mega cast of the other New Year's Six Bowl games on ESPN too. I get that it's college football. I get the bowls are going to be on. I get it. But you have to put this somewhere other than ESPNU. I, I know the Big 12 has some blame for playing on New Year's Day, but ESPN can work a little harder to promote that game. Yeah, I know. I agree hundred percent. I, I think that the only defense I would say is yes, it was new year's day where you're going to have the new year's day bowl games. And two, maybe since Iowa state has kind of been a surprise team, maybe, you know, looking ahead, they didn't look at that as kind of being a marquee game, but you're right. I mean, to not promote it. And when you look at that, in a in a vacuum and just say that one instance, it doesn't look too bad. But then when you look and you say Duke Gonzaga, uh, Villanova, uh, uh, UCLA, Gonzaga, UCLA, I believe all games that were played at what 10 30, 11 o'clock at night, you know, it just hasn't been a good job showcasing the top teams in your sport. Like in that instance uh, on new year's day, I, I kind of understand it. There is at least some reason, you know, there was no reason. I, I understand the games are being played on the West coast. There was no reason for these games to be played at 10 30 on a Friday night, or, or I think the Villanova UCLA game was like 11 30 on a Friday night. Yeah. Like it, when, when you view the new year's day, uh, incident with Baylor and, and Iowa State that you're mentioning kind of with the knowledge of what they've done all season long it just doesn't look good and like you mentioned uh, it seems like every big broadcast has some sort of NBA draft angle to it which we've hit on in the past um, yeah it just it, it hasn't been great uh, coverage so far I mean hopefully now uh, when now that college football is, is over and, and the NFL is going to be uh, done in the month we get kind of more of a focus on uh, college basketball from these networks but yeah that that was definitely a letdown it's been a letdown really for the past two months now be fair i think it's really espn problem because cbs cares when they when they do their games they put they, they put the announcers out there they do all this stuff fox cares and they do their games and another example i'll point out from the same week was they had lsu and auburn two top 20 teams in the pack in the sc which is one of the best conferences in the country no announcers were there they did it remotely and had the people calling out the monitor and the audio levels were completely out of whack and that's a top 20 game with two tremendous basketball teams like why are you investing in the product? You're not going to put any real effort into it. And yeah, the same thing happened at uh, UConn, West Virginia. That was a while back. 
same thing. The announcers are calling it from, uh, from, from the studio and just didn't sound good. Like you mentioned, I, I mean, that's a whole other thing about not sending announcers to, to games. I, at this point now, the announcers should be at games uh, no matter what. There should be no more studio broadcast. But, but yeah, like you mentioned, if you're not going to put the money into it, you know, why broadcast it? Uh, it, it is really a shame to, to, to see college basketball kind of be thrown to the back seat like this. Yeah, and I think, again, I will point out, this is an ESPN-specific problem where, like, they assume that, oh, the audience doesn't care. We're, we're, we're going to put our, put our everything. We're going to cut the corner on that broadcast, and we're going to have 17,000 different channels broadcast the Rose Bowl game, which is, on, which is only relevant to those two teams and not have any impact on the playoffs. So that just bothers me. Yeah, no, and, and I agree 100%. It's, it's, it's been an issue all season long. It has for sure. Let's get to some of the on the course, out, which is really, I think, the more interesting stuff here, which – We'll start with Baylor, which obviously last time we talked, they demolished Villanova in that top 10 matchup. They went on the road to beat Oregon. Now they beat Iowa State. They are undefeated, one of three undefeated teams left as of recording time in the country. And this caught me a surprise. Do you really think that this team can repeat? I think so. They they just, you know, they have the experience, the championship experience, obviously. And they play defense, man. And, and when you play defense, like they play defense. I mean, I've never seen Villanova that out of whack in a game before. Uh, Villanova obviously is a three-point shooting team. You know, they go through some, you know, they're kind of streaky in terms of that. But a team watching that game a couple weeks ago when they just shut out Villanova defensively, that tells me, you know, if you can shut out a team like a top 25 team like that uh, and basically hold them to one of their worst offensive performances ever, uh, you're only going to get better. You know, uh, Scott Drew is a great coach. They're only going to improve, I think. And when they play and they're going to be battle tested in the Big 12 as well, which we'll get to. Uh, it's, a, it's a fantastic conference. Uh, I think that, you know, as of right now, they're number one. They're, they're, they're in, in my opinion, going to go into uh, March Madness as probably the favorite unless something changes in the next uh, two months. And the way that they play defense, I think it's just going to be it's going to be really, really tough for someone to beat them because, you know, we saw it with, with Virginia and it took Virginia a while, but Virginia did eventually win a national title playing that type of way. Uh, it can be done. And I think Baylor's, you know, they like I said, they have the experience and I, I wouldn't count them out as, as one of the favorites for sure. Yeah, I also point out here, you mentioned the defense, too. Their offense is also incredible. I mean, they're the only team in, I think their number, I'm on the Ken Palm rankings right now, their number five most efficient offense in the country, number four defensively. They said Michigan State, how big the Baylor offense is, because they ran them out of the gym in the battle for Atlanta. And that Michigan State team looked very good in their first two games. So, Baylor's was a big threat. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And, and the offense, like I, like uh, you just mentioned, when it's the top, you know, five Ken Palm offense as well. You know, it's going to be hard to compete with them, um, you know, Virginia, like I, I kind of brought up the Virginia example, but I kind of the knock on them was they were trying to win games, you know, 55, 53 or something like that. Baylor doesn't necessarily need to do that because like you mentioned, they have a really talented offense as well to go along with what I think is the best defense in the country. Yeah, for sure. I want to go to the SEC now, which I think is obviously the deepest conference in the country this season. And they have so many great teams. I mean, LSU is undefeated till last week. You have mm. Auburn, Kentucky, Tennessee, Alabama, Florida, the list goes on and on and on here. So, mm. Of that pie, who do you think is the best team in the SEC right now? You know, I, I really like Tennessee. I, I feel like, you know, they, they lost their first conference game. They've got three losses already. I don't know if they're the best team. Auburn is probably going to get all the headlines, and, and Kentucky, of course, is going to kind of get, uh, you know, all of the all of the news about them. But I like Tennessee. I, I don't know. I like Fulkerson. I like uh, Viscovi, the, the other guy that they got. Fulkerson's been in college for like six years. Um, I, I like Tennessee. I, I think that they're a good team. They got some senior leadership. But like you mentioned, that conference is so deep. When you look at Auburn, Kentucky, Alabama, um, Arkansas is having some struggles right now. Everyone thought Arkansas was a top 25 team to start the year. LSU, uh, t- Tennessee, they got six, seven teams. Florida, who I was really high on early in the se- or uh, going into the season, they're going to, you know, they're going to be a deep conference. They're going to be up there for one of the best uh, in, in the country. So I don't really know if there's a wrong answer. I just, I, I have, I have a soft spot for Tennessee, I think. Yeah. I, I'm looking there also at Jay Bellis put out his bill, his first top 68 rankings of the season today. And he has Auburn and Kentucky top two in the conference. I agree on the Auburn take there because obviously the Walker Castle made a huge impact since he transferred in there. They have the NBA. They have a lot. They're gonna have a lot of ESPN now. Is dropping on the Auburn and broadcast like Jabari Smith because he is a stud. He's gonna be probably one of the top picks in the draft. And that team is so talented. They went to LSU and beat them up pretty badly that last game. So I would not be shocked. Auburn's our top SEC team entering the tournament. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Auburn, they look really, really good right now. They're, they're riding high. And, you know, as we always said, you're going to be battle tested playing in a conference like that where, you know, almost every game, maybe not necessarily to the level of like the big 12 or the big 10, but every game is going to be going to be a fight uh, in, in that conference for sure. Yeah, and I look at the AP poll this week. I think the Big 12 and the SEC combined for 10 to 25 spots, which is absurd. Yeah, those two conferences, probably the two best conferences in America right now. Uh, the Big 10 is, is, is strong as well. But, yeah, SEC and Big 12, you look at the depth of those two conferences, it's, it's incredible. Yeah, I want to go to the Big 12 next because, obviously, we talked about their teams here. We, they have a lot of mm-hmm. great groups in there. I see Baylor's number one. Kansas is top 10. Mm-hmm. Texas is flirted with it at times. You have – Oklahoma State's in Ellsworth is unfortunate, but you have Oklahoma, you have West Virginia, you have a bunch of great teams. So there are 10 teams in this league. How many do you see them getting in? Well, they got, what, five ranked in the top 25 right now. Uh, so that's for certain. I think Oklahoma is a tournament team. That's six. And then, I mean, between West Virginia, K-State, and TCU, probably one of them gets in as well. So we're probably looking at seven, maybe even eight teams from, a, what, an 11-team conference and 10 that are eligible. Yeah, that's uh, that's that's pretty pretty uh, impressive. Iowa State's been the surprise team of the season, for sure. Uh, what a job that coach is on, uh, Ulzerberger there, uh, uh, coaching Iowa State. I mean, just a phenomenal, you know, t- a top-10 team. They obviously suffered their first loss to Baylor over the weekend, which we touched on. Um, you know, no one saw them being – anywhere near they I think they were picking near the bottom of the conference for sure we yeah. touched on Baylor Kansas is a top you know 10 team they got uh Agbaji, who I think is probably you know a top 10 player in the in the in the country if not top five uh I was really high on Texas going into the season they're a top 15 team so yeah you look at the big the big 12 I mean it's not crazy to say they send seven or eight teams to the tournament yeah, I'm looking at the count right now because I always think the five ranked teams, I think I, I think I get in there. I like West yeah. Virginia because they've had a good non-conference run. Yeah. Mm-hmm. TCU, I think, is the fringe one because I think they have to win games in the league. I don't think they clearly play anybody outside the conference. And one thing yeah. I was Iowa State also made a great point about how quick they turn around. Like, Otzelberger, I mean, this team ended last year on an 18-game losing streak, and they've won 12 in a row to start the year for it. And they played Baylor very hard before they lost. I think them, Minnesota to a lesser extent in the Big Ten shows you that, like, you know what, with the like the instant tra- transfer rule, like you can rebuild very quickly in college basketball. There's no excuse to be bad for that long if you're at a power five school. Yeah, yeah. And if you get the right coach like uh, Iowa State and Michigan or Minnesota probably have, yeah, you can rebuild, you know, within a year. Uh, like you mentioned, Iowa State was was horrible last year, one of the worst teams uh, in, in the country. Uh, look at them now. They're number 11, and they're poised at least right now. They're in a really good spot to make the uh, to make the NCAA tournament if they really just play you know decent. I, I don't think that they're going to keep up the run that they're on right now. I'm sure that they'll fall back a little bit. But if they you know play around 500 in the conference, they're going to get a good seed in the NCAA tournament, which if you would have said that three months ago, I think people would have thought you were crazy. I think it's tough about the Big 12, though, is always that the league is so rugged that like – you could just play well and still lose three games in a row. I'm like sitting there and you're out of the pole. Like what happened? Yeah, exactly. And, and I think we mentioned that about the, the big 10 as well. And I think those two conferences are very similar in that, like you mentioned, you could play, you know, two or three really strong games in a row and lose all three of them, or you could play a really strong game. And then, you know, you lose that in overtime, let's say, you know, two days later, you're playing someone else on the road, you come back, come out a little flat, you know, you're down double digits early. You got to fight back and you, and you still lose that game as well. Like, you know, losses can just avalanche in these conferences for sure. Uh, especially the big 12 and the big 10 where, you know, there's so many, there's so much depth and the sec really, there's so much depth in these conferences. Yeah. You know, a, a two game losing streak can really quickly turn into like a four or five game losing streak, just how the schedule breaks out and how good these teams are. Yeah. Let's go to the big 10 now. And the big 10 is a little bit of a cluster F right now. If you look at their standings here, cause I mean, Purdue lost last night to Wisconsin and they had a very bad effort in that game. So they, they're one and two in the league. And they, we thought they were a national title favorite, which is something else. And then you look at the team, like Michigan's underachieved Michigan state, which I call preseason to be top 15, like by January, they're top 10 already, which is impressive for them. Ohio state's good. You got a lot of depth in this league. What do you think about the big 10 as a whole? it there the the story for now at least i think is a lot of teams kind of underachieving or a lot of teams that we thought uh were going to be at the top of this conference are not right now i mean michigan state and ohio state and even illinois to an extent i think people were pretty high on those teams people thought those teams would be pretty good but michigan's got five losses already 
Um, you know, Purdue just suffered their second conference loss. Indiana just lost to Penn State the other day. Uh, I thought Indiana was for sure, you know, a tournament team. I thought they were, uh, after seeing them play St. John's, I thought that they were, you know, going to be around a top 25 team. Uh, they've already, you know, lost two games in the conference. So in my opinion, the, the story of the Big Ten right now is some teams kind of underachieving, actually. And, you know, like we just mentioned, losses can snowball, losses can avalanche uh, in this conference when you, you know, when you lose one, two, three, four in a row, just because of how, de how deep it is. Uh, I think Michigan, a team like Michigan is going to figure it out. They'll be a tournament team. Um, but, you know, for now, some of these teams maybe are, are underachieving a little bit and showing just how deep the conference is. Yeah, for me, I think you look the way I look at it is like, I think Nebraska is the worst team in this league by far. And then yeah. if you look at teams like Minnesota, Northwestern, Penn State are playing much harder than we thought they would at the start of the season. It's making it much harder. Yeah, and even Rutgers, you know, taking down Purdue. Uh, yeah, I mean, right now, outside of, of probably Nebraska, it doesn't look like any team is in that conference is going to be an easy win. Uh, and even Nebraska on uh, on Sunday took Ohio State down to, to overtime, I believe, uh, in, in, in uh, Lincoln. So, yeah, it, it really looks like every game in that conference is going to be tough, um, which you can say about a couple different conferences, but – yeah, the big the Big Ten is is uh, definitely going to have a lot of depth, and it's going to be a lot of cannibalism. I think teams beating up on each other. I don't think you're going to see any team, uh, you know, winning 16 games in that in that conference this season. I think it's going to be a lot of uh, parity in that conference for sure. Yeah, and I will point out also, I think Michigan State. I think the way their schedule's gotten off is very good. I think they're getting Michigan at the right time here because Michigan is still trying to find their way. If they get past that game, they had the brass that wins. They should win that game. So if they get past Michigan five and zero in the conference, look out. They could be really really tough to beat in that league. And you were, you were right on them all the way through. I, I wasn't really as high on them uh, personally, but, but yeah, they've looked really, really good so far uh, this season and they've gotten off to a really solid start in conference play. Yeah. I have on my calendar circled the 26th of February. They host Purdue. That's the only time they meet this season. That's going to be fun. Yeah. Uh -huh. and, and you know, the thing about the big 10 that I love is just like every weekend or every, you know, every night, basically there's a game where you're like, well, that's a cool matchup. You know, Michigan state, Ohio state, Oh, uh, you know, Wisconsin, uh, Michigan, there's just always, a, always a matchup that I'm like, Oh, okay. I could, I could check that out. That's a pretty decent uh, matchup. So that's what I love about the big 10. I do love that too. I also love that for the big East too, because the big East is we talked about a couple of times here, this conference is going to be so stacked and Villanova yeah. is getting written off a little bit because they play a tough schedule of all those losses, but they mm -hmm. came out, they beat up Seton Hall over the weekend. They're kind, mm -hmm. of, kind of finding their groove. Mm -hmm. Seton Hall, we mentioned UConn. And some of the programs are on pause, like UConn St. John's. But I think the depth of that league is also incredible. Yeah, it is. And, and you talk about Villanova. Um, you know, they really righted the ship these last these last couple of games. And that was a big win for them at Seton Hall. That was a tough environment uh, at the Prudential Center. They had a, a really nice crowd there. And, uh, yeah, Villanova just, just willed their way through. I mean, like I mentioned, Seton Hall, I think, was only playing with eight guys. Uh, they were missing Ike Obiagu, who's one of their best shot blockers and rebounders. Villanova just dominated the glass in that game. And, uh, yeah, really found their way. Um, I, you know, I don't love how they still don't want to go deep into their bench, Villanova, but they're still, I think, at least over the last week, I think that they – or the last couple of weeks, I think that they showed they're still the class of this conference – um, you know, there's a lot of talented teams in this conference. Providence has really uh, been the surprise so far. Seton Hall off a couple of good teams already. Uh, UConn, I think, is going to be there as well. And Xavier is, is, a, is a top 25 team also. But I still think, you know, until, unless someone dethrones Villanova, uh, you know, later on in the season or in the conference tournament, it's still Villanova's conference to lose. Um, but, you know, the depth is still there for the Big East as well. Uh, my team, St. John's, hasn't even played a conference game yet due to uh, COVID pause. But, you know, in this conference, I, I don't think it's crazy to say that they send probably six or even seven teams to the to the tournament, depending on, um, you know, how, how the, the schedule breaks out and who beats who. Uh, you know, Georgetown and, and DePaul probably won't be tournament teams, but I think you could pretty much make a case uh, for every other team. Maybe, maybe not Butler as well, but you can make a case probably for – eight teams to get in uh, eight teams won't get in, but you know, the, the, the and it's, it's got that depth again. Yeah. And I think the team we even mentioned there is province is 13 and one on the year so far. And that trio of Nate Watson, uh, Noah Horsler and Al Durham is ridiculous. And uh -huh. Ed Cooley's had a really good job getting that team back at the top of the conference again. Yeah. And Al 
Durham has been one of the best transfers in the, in the country for them. Uh, he's been really, really impactful. And Nate Watson is, is looking like we thought he was going to be, you know, we thought that team was going to kind of run through Watson and it has, uh, he's been really, really good. And, and Horkler, like you mentioned, he killed St. John's in a couple of games last year. Uh, another guy who's, who's really, really stepped it up for them. And yeah, Providence, they've, without a doubt, they've been the surprise team of the Big East so far. And they're probably, you know, up there with, like you said, Minnesota and Iowa State as maybe some of the surprise teams of the country so far. Yeah, you look at the Providence schedule this year. They play good teams. They have some good wins in there, right? So maybe they're 13 and one. I mean, they won at Wisconsin. Grant Wisconsin a little shorthanded. They didn't win that game. They beat Texas Tech in the Big East Big 12 battle. They beat yeah. UConn. They beat Seton Hall already. So, and great start for them. Yeah, they've already got a couple of resume wins on their schedule. So, yeah, they're looking like a uh, like a team that could you know potentially be you know a, a decent seed in the NCAA tournament and, and maybe win a game, which is kind of the ceiling for Providence. You know, get get a get a win in the turn in the NCAA tournament and uh, you know see what happens in the second round. Yeah, and St. John's plays them on Saturday up in up in Rhode Island. So that's gonna be fun. They do. Yeah, that's a big game for St. John's. That's yeah, you know St. John's didn't do themselves any favors in the uh, in the non conference losing to to Pittsburgh. Uh, they played three Power Five teams. They lost to all of them. They lost to Kansas and they lost to. Indiana uh we've hit on both of them uh before yeah and and you know they've they've got to do some work in the conference now they probably need 11 to 12 wins in the conference which is going to be a tall order because the Big East like we said it's very deep it's got like I said six seven teams that you can make a case for in the NCAA tournament so you know almost every game now for St. John's is going to be not a must win but it's it's going to be important you know they, they can't take any nights off that they can't have any uh, bad losses. And it, it starts tomorrow night against DePaul and then the big game on, on Saturday against number 16 Providence. Yeah. I'm looking at their schedule. I mean, they had four games already postponed due to COVID and like now they're going to be playing a lot of games like down the stretch here. That team's got a very hard road. Yeah, exactly. And, and for them, it's kind of a bummer because, you know, they had a game against Butler and a game against Georgetown, uh, uh, postpone, which are two teams, like I mentioned, that are probably near the bottom of the conference. Butler would have been a, a home game as well. You know, it was a chance for St. John's to get off to maybe a three and one, four and one type start uh, in the conference, just based on, you know, the, the, how their schedule broke. And now they kind of lose that, but obviously those games will get rescheduled, but yeah, it's a bummer for St. John's, but they're, they're going to have to win those games regardless, whether they want them, you know, in December or February or January, they, they have to win uh, those type of games against Georgetown and DePaul and, and Butler. Yeah, I'm looking. I think the market home game has not been rescheduled yet, but the other mm -hmm. one seems you have been, and it's like there are lots of weeks of playing three times or like five, yeah. ten days. They have a lot of work to do. Yeah, and it's like we we spoke at the at the top of this. You know, it you know when you have to play three games in a week, you wonder what it's going to do to these teams. St. John's going to be a perfect example of that they're a team that has NCAA tournament aspirations and is going to have a, a, a couple of weeks now where they're playing three games in a week. Uh, they play Seton Hall later this month. Uh, two times in three days, they play the Seton Hall. That's a challenge. <laughs> that's that's going to be a challenge for, and that's not just St. John's. That's all over the country. Teams are going to have to deal with this. Yeah, the good old fashioned NBA style home and home with Seton Hall. That's a new one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's yeah. uh makes me think of the NBA for sure. Yeah, and I think the second one, I think is on the Monday one. I think is like at like at their game gym on campus. I don't get they don't use the Prudential Center. It is, yeah. It's a uh, it's a Walsh gym for Seton Hall, and I believe it's only uh, only Seton Hall students are able to go to that game. So that'll kind of be a unique unique setting uh, to see St. John's and, and Seton Hall playing at uh, Seton Hall's campus arena. Much smaller crowd than you would expect for those two teams. Yeah, that'll that'll be kind of cool. It's like we were talking about a couple of years ago. We wanted St. John's to play more games at Connor Second, the Big East, because those games the they play a different experience. I'll never give the Garden up, but like just mm -hmm. I think the intensity they have at Connor Second I think is almost more unmatched than it is at MSG. Yeah, and then perfect example of that was when they played Pitt. I was at that game a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, you know, the, the crowd was was not great. It was probably, you know, it was a decent amount of Pittsburgh fans there as well. And that's kind of how it goes for St. John's when they play, you know, Villanova and Georgetown and UConn and, and Seton Hall um, uh, in, in, you know, Big East games at home at Madison Square Garden. It's, you know, kind of a 60-40 type split. It's a home court advantage. Sure, it's a recruiting advantage, but – at the end of the day, it doesn't bring that type of advantage that uh, that you would hope that Karnasek does. Yeah, let's talk about a couple of mid-major things to watch here. So let's start here. One, at, oh, I'm going to say here, which conference gets more bids, the WCC or the ACC? <laughs> I, I, I would still say the ACC. I, I I think, but I mean that's that's a question that I don't think we thought we were going to have uh, two months ago about. But yeah, it's 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 uh, it speaks to the strength of the WCC, but also the kind of struggles or the crap of the ACC so far. 
you know, the WCC has four legitimate like like tournament teams. It's obviously, Gonzaga we know about. BYU was right for a while. Mm-hmm. Saint San Francisco is having a renaissance. I mean, the yeah. thirteen and one they they and they credit to them for impressive scheduling. Gonzaga had to postpone that game. They went yeah. to Loyola Chicago, which is awesome because they're mm-hmm. playing. I think two o'clock at a JUCO in Utah on Thursday, which is amazing. <laughs> yeah. And and I mean that's what these these schools have to do. You know, it's it's uh it's kind of similar to what we saw last year. You know, you got to be adaptable, and if you lose one opportunity you got to find someone else to play uh you know credit to them for doing that because you know like you said that those games aren't going to make make themselves up and sometimes you know like like we mentioned iona losing a game against seton hall uh you know you don't get credit for not playing a game so these teams are trying to figure out any way that they can to to strengthen their schedule yeah they they that one the fourth one in the wc is obviously saint mary's who they've been playing off to a good start so i see those league as these that beat each other up a little bit and make sure they don't catalyze each other but the acc i want to take a second here i mean like after Duke, where are we going here? Who's getting the tournament? Because North Carolina looks shaky. Wake Forest, Virginia Tech, Miami's right how they play. Nobody. I mean, like that league's a mess. Yeah, yeah. And I think uh, when, we, when you had me on last month, I think that you asked me if they get four and a half. And I, I think I took the over on that. I'm not feeling as confident <laughs> about that right now. But like you said, behind Duke, I don't know, man. I mean, I still think North Carolina will probably get in, but. Yeah, I mean, after that, it's a bunch of, you know, four, five, six lost teams that just don't look any good uh, right now. So, yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely less confident. I think that our over-under has probably shifted from like four and a half to like two and a half in, in the last month uh, in terms of how many teams the ACC gets in. I said the number now is three and a half. I think that's the right number now. Yeah, yeah, I would say, yeah, three and a half is, is fair. It's, it's shifted down to one uh, because, like you said, I, I think the Duke is obviously a lock. UNC will get in and then they'll probably figure out one more team. And then it's kind of a toss up if they get a fourth. Yeah. And Duke's not going to play another ranked team the rest of the season. No way the ACC is going to get close <laughs> to the top 25. No, I mean, I mean, maybe UNC will, they've only got the three losses right now, but, but yeah, their, their, their schedule is not going to do them any favors, which is kind of crazy. Right. I mean, in the ACC, you'd expect to have a lot of opportunities at at quad one wins. Uh, it's kind of barren right now because of how bad the, the conference is. So we'll see how much that hurts Duke uh, from a seeding perspective. Uh, you know, in, in two months from now, de- de- depending on how many real opportunities they get uh, for big wins in the ACC, which right now doesn't look like very many. Yeah, for sure. I I think, obviously, I'm interested to see the Mountain West, how that plays out, too, because Colorado State's on beat and haven't played for a while because of COVID. San Diego State is probably a tournament team. Boise mm-hmm. State's pretty good. Nevada's dangerous. We've seen what they – they gave Kansas in a little trouble, like when they went to the Fog last week to do that. I think that's a fun week to watch track also. Definitely. Yeah. And Colorado state right now is the, the class of that conference, but yeah, like you mentioned, there's four or five teams and, uh, and um, you know, San Diego state is always going to be a, a strong competitor in that conference. So curious to see how that shakes out. Yeah. I think also to close on the local angle here, go to, go to Iona here. Cause obviously they are right now, they, they've had COVID problems. Unlike last year where it was their own problems. Now everybody who they seem to play has COVID and now they they're trying to guess they find games, their entire schedule. I think for the, for, for the last four scheduled games have all been postponed. The Mac moved one up for them. They play on Sunday against Maris. They squeak one out. Now they don't have anything this whole week. They're trying to get a game on the schedule non-conference. So it's going to be a challenge for Patino and company over there to sort of keep that group sharp because they're through no fault of their own, not going to play enough, play enough games. Yeah, no, exactly. And it's, it's like you mentioned, I mean, how many games do these teams actually actually get in, in terms of, of uh, these low major conference teams. So they got to be adaptable. Like we said, uh, got to be willing to kind of take on a game on a short notice and, uh, yeah, it's going to be tough for Iona, but they're still the class of that conference. I, I still think that they'll probably take care of business in that conference and uh, and uh, get the automatic bid. But, you know, we'll see in terms of what seed they actually get in the NCAA tournament uh, because they do this year actually have, you know, an impressive uh, non-conference win over Alabama. Yeah, I, I know Fatino has said that he's working on trying to get them like a top 25 type non-conference game like in there this week. I'm I think a lot of teams are scared of playing Patino on short notice. I don't know how successful they're going to be, but they should try and get something on the schedule. Maybe it's another like high quality mid that needs a needs a schedule boost because they're gonna have a lot of gains in the map that could drag their net down. Yeah, and, and you know, for a team like Iona, it's it's kind of a, a low risk, high reward thing. You know, if you do get a game against a top twenty five team or a, you know a power conference team, um, you know, it's you know if you lose that game as an underdog, you're not really going to get killed for it. It won't really hurt your resume. Uh, if you do pick up a win like we saw them do against Alabama earlier this season, it's a huge resume boost and it's a potentially a chance to you know boost yourself up a seed line or two, which in that turn makes you know your first round tournament game a little bit uh, more easy to win. So or, or at least you know more likely to win. So yeah, I, if, if they have to be adaptable, they have to be willing to to take on some games, and um, yeah, we'll we'll see if they're able to do that. 
Yeah, and let's wrap it up here. We're not going to be back for a little bit because obviously the football is kind of taking over here. But like, what are some games you're looking forward to over the next like few weeks that you're excited to see? Yeah, well, I got one circled on my calendar. Uh, it's it's uh, when is this? January fifteenth, which is I believe two Saturdays from now. Uh, showdown in the SEC between Tennessee and Kentucky. Uh, like I mentioned, I'm very high on Tennessee. I, I like them a lot. Uh, I, I think that Tennessee is, is not the maybe not the best team in that conference, but I still think that they're very, very strong. And that's a good measuring stick game for them against Tennessee or against Kentucky, who I think is one of the best teams uh, in that conference. And then later that day, you've also got or is it late? Yeah, later that day, you've also got Texas and Iowa State, a battle in the Big 12 uh, two again, two ranked teams, two top 15 teams. Iowa State's been the surprise of that conference. Texas, uh, I still think Texas is a Final Four team, or at least has a Final Four caliber team. Uh, that's a fun day. And then, you know, you've also got in the Big East that day, UConn and Providence, big game. UConn could be ranked by then. Arkansas and LSU in the in the uh, SEC. So that's a really fun Saturday, uh, two Saturdays from now. you got a lot of big games uh, on the schedule for, uh, for uh, uh, January 15th, that is. I'm very, I'm going to be very aggressive here. I'm going to be bold because this, this is the end of the month. So who knows what Kobe's going to do to this, but the big 12 SEC challenge this year is going to be huge. I mean, some of the matches here, I went to that day. I mean, you got Oklahoma and Auburn in playing in that day. You got West Virginia going to Arkansas. The big one of the day, Baylor going to Alabama. That could be their first loss. They haven't lost in big 12 play at that point. You also have Kentucky taking on Kansas, Tennessee taking on Texas. That's a huge day of basketball. Yeah, and when, when you have, you know, two of the top maybe three conferences in America playing uh, this late in the season as well, where everyone is kind of rounding into form now, uh, yeah, the Big 12 and SEC Challenge is always a, always a fun time. But, you know, it feels like in the past – that challenge has always kind of been about, all right, like Kentucky, who's Kentucky playing and who's Kansas playing now, you know, both of those conferences are, are really, really strong. And like you just mentioned, that's six, seven really good matchups uh, over a weekend. That, that's going to be a, a really fun thing. Hopefully COVID cooperates and we don't get any of those postponed or I would assume canceled outright. Uh, Cause that would be a real shame. So hopefully we're past it by then. Yeah. Two more underrated ones on that slate. Also LSU takes on TCU. That's enough. That's in the uh, big 12 IC challenge. And then, Mississippi State, which is an underrated team in the SEC, they're going to Texas Tech. That's another good matchup. Yeah, yeah, two kind of underrated teams, uh, Mississippi State and Texas Tech. So yeah, I mean, you know, it's 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 kind of like when the Big East played the uh, played the the Big Twelve as well. There's not a whole lot of bad matchups that, that you would get because it's a lot of really good teams. It's it's very deep leagues. Um, I think that's kind of what's what's been cool about college basketball this season is besides the ACC, you know, the Big Twelve, the SEC, the Big Ten, and the and the Big East are all very very deep conferences. Uh, it's going to be really cool to see, you know, which conference kind of emerges as, as, as the, the, the top dog. But there's, I think, really probably three or four conferences really have a case for that, that top slot as the nation's best conference this season, which is really, really fun. You know, parity is good for, for college basketball. We don't see parity that much in college football. So it, it's good to see that in college basketball where, you know, you have a lot of teams that feel like they can be uh, uh, championship contenders both in their own conference and uh, nationally. Absolutely. And Troy, thanks for all the time. I really appreciate it. We'll probably check back in. I'd say probably after the Super Bowl will be the next time checking because then we're really going to get the casuals might come with us then at that point. They might be ready to hop on board. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Late or, uh, you know, early February, mid February is kind of where college basketball starts picking up steam nationally. You know, the, the diehards are in right now. Like you mentioned, the casual fans kind of start to come in in February and then they, they're with us all the way through March Madness. So, yeah, really looking forward to it, Mike. Yeah. Maybe ESPN will join us at that point to care about it. <laughs> yeah we can hope fingers crossed I, i'm not holding my breath though <laughs> yeah for sure troy if people want to follow you on twitter how can they do that sure you can follow me on twitter uh, at troy moriello that last name is m-a-u-r-i-e-l-l-o uh yeah i do the seeing red podcast cover st john's basketball and uh, a little bit of the big east as a whole so if you're a st john's fan or you're a big east fan or you're just a college basketball fan definitely check that out yeah, I meant to ask, how is the Seeing Red podcast doing without any actual St. John's games for three weeks? It's It's been tough. We we did do – we luckily did a show a couple of weeks ago um, be, uh, before the Pittsburgh game. But, yeah, we haven't haven't done a show in three weeks, so I'm looking forward to getting back to it uh, and talking about uh, their game against DePaul. Uh, maybe not the best, the most sexy opponent, but I'll be happy to at least have a, have, have a game to talk about for the first time in almost a month. Yeah, for sure. Troy, thanks for all the time. I really appreciate it. Definitely, Mike. Talk soon.